Introduction to electrochemical cells. In this video, we're going to look at electrochemical cells. We'll introduce what an electrochemical cell is, and these come in two forms, galvanic and electrolytic. So we'll talk about both and how to tell the difference between them. You'll need to know how to tell if a reaction will happen spontaneously and which reaction would occur spontaneously. And then if we, you need to determine if instead you would need to put energy in to make the cell happen. This will also be covered in later videos, where we'll talk about it in a slightly different way. And then also in later videos, we will cover specifically some components of electrolytic cells, which are a little more specific to electrolytic cells. So look out for those videos. Um, they are in the playlist where you may have accessed this. They are um, in the links in Canvas, and I'll also link them on the end screen. Both an electrolytic and a galvanic cell are very similar. But in a galvanic cell, a spontaneous reaction occurs. In an electrolytic cell, a non-spontaneous reaction occurs. Or in other words, an energy source must be supplied to drive the reaction. This schematic here shows us the basic idea of what makes a cell. Often the two reactions are separated into different areas. A metal electrode is suspended in a solution of one ionic species, and then another metal electrode is often suspended in a solution of the other ionic species. Electrons then run along a wire where either the voltage of the reaction can be measured or in the case of an electrolytic cell where you are going to be supplying energy to drive the reaction and drive the electrons. A salt bridge allows for the transfer of counter ions from one side of the reaction to the other. This is going to be necessary in both um, electrolytic and galvanic cells to keep the charge balance of the solutions um, well, balanced. In both electrolytic and galvanic cells, oxidation occurs at the anode and reduction occurs at the cathode. This doesn't change based on whether it's an electrolytic or galvanic cell. It's always oxidation at the anode, reduction at the cathode. And of course, the memory trick for this was a red cat and an ox. And you should feel free to come up with your own and let me know if you have better ones. Given this reaction, we can also see what is occurring in each place. At the cathode, we can see that copper is going from a plus two to a zero. Or you can think of it as from an ionic species to a metallic. And so metal would be deposited on the copper electrode. And you would actually be able to measure this as the mass of the copper electrode increasing. At the anode, you can see that solid zinc goes into an ionic species. Similarly, you can see this when you run the experiment as a decrease in mass of the electrode. Now, because we're given the reactions, we don't have to decide whether that will or won't happen or which one will be spontaneous. We can just kind of take it at face value. Um, we'll look at some other ones later where I tell you whether it's spontaneous or not, and then you have to make a decision about which way the reaction's gonna go. So remember that our oxidation occurs at our anode, our reduction occurs at our cathode. And so since our copper is here, that's how we knew that that was the cathode and because it's being reduced. And that's how we knew that zinc was our anode because it's being oxidized. So we'll be able to see that electrons are moving from our anode where they're produced to our cathode where they're absorbed. In galvanic cells, we generally separate the reactions in this manner where they're in different beakers or different containers or different segments of the battery, etc. Um, so that we can use the electrons rather than having them go directly to the other species without doing any work for us. That being said, there are many kinds of batteries and ways of accomplishing this um, than just putting them in separate beakers. So we'll also see when we more specifically discuss particular cases of electrolytic cells that we actually don't need to put these in completely separate containers and that rather the anode and the cathode can exist within the same solution since, all, since you're driving the reaction by putting um, electrons in. Similarly, in our basic structure of a cell bridge shown here, we're going to need a salt bridge to allow for the flow of anions and cations. This keeps the solutions charge balance um, and allows the ions to move back and forth to do that. And again, in more complicated batteries and electrolytic cells, um, sometimes that all happens in the same solution or sometimes that salt bridge more like a membrane. Um, 
but there's got to be some way of charge balancing the solutions. In summary, we have discussed the structure of an electrochemical cell. Um, and as part of this, we've also discussed the electron flow and the ion flow. You'll need to identify the anode and the cathode of reactions. And we're going to go into this a bit more in the next video as well. Um, so on this note, how would we know which reactions are happening? And if they're, if they're not specifically given, like what I did in this video where I tell you what's happening. And then how would we know what voltage we get? How do we know how to measure it? So these are all great questions that really this video isn't set up to answer. We're going to answer these in later videos, um, talking more specifically about each one.